Today I'm going to talk about the Android development with uh, WebRTC. Uh, the summary of the talk basically is uh, we are going to see the options that we have to integrate in uh, WebRTC into, into an Android, Android application. And we are going to have a, a live demo and how to use WebRTC using the Java APIs provided by WebRTC, the bindings that they have. So uh, let's start with options. The options here are, are from the point of view of uh, using WebRTC. So at the end, if you are using other language or, or other framework, whatever, uh, they are going to use these, uh, these three options. Maybe you are not doing some of them, but the, the framework will use one of these. So we have the Android Web View. Uh, we, we are going to see that, the native, uh, the Java API for WebRTC and the C++ API. Let's start with the Android Web View. This, uh, the, the Web View that is based on Chrome is the, it was in, added to, to Android uh, some time ago. Uh, it replaced the old Web View that was in, uh, already available in, in Android using WebKit. And this new, this new Web View uh, uses uh, uh, Chrome and it has WebRTC support. It was introduced on Android 4.4. But the, the problem with that is that it was introduced using a very old version from Chrome, and it, w uh, it was not supporting well WebRTC. So at the end, uh, it's only usable in, in Lollipop and, and higher. So uh, the good thing of the, uh, on new devices is that it is updated very frequently with every version of Chrome. So it's one of the options. Uh, but it has some limitations. Uh, the problem with the not working only on Lollipop, at the end, there are a lot of devices that you are not targeting if you are using the web view. And, and Lollipop and, and newer uh, versions are only like the 50% of the, of the market share of Android. The other thing is that the, the web view is an external component in, on Android, so it's updated outside your application. That means that uh, it's a good thing, maybe, but also uh, it can break your app. You don't control when the, the web view is updated. That means that sometimes people can be running your application in a, in a web view that you have not, you have not tested or, or something. Or maybe you need to update the web view and people is not doing that. So you cannot force that. And the other thing is that all the video views are inside the web view. As all the web, web view applications, everything is contained on the web view. So if you want to mix uh, the, the video views with, with other components, uh, UI components from Android, it's something that is not easy to do. As alternative for, um, for, the, for the web view, this is the most popular one that is Crosswalk. It's an Intel uh, open source project that they, they compile Chrome and they provide the, the Chromium build for, for you to use as, a, as the web view. The good things about that, the pros are that they have uh, 4.0 uh, support, so it works on more devices. Uh, you can decide if you can embed the, the binary inside your application, so you, you can decide when to update. That is a good, is a good thing, depending on, on your use case. And you have always the latest version of Chromium. That is also a good thing. As cons, you have that the, the uh, as you embed the, the binary inside your application, the, the binary size is going to to increase a lot. That is, the Chromium is a very big, big project. And also, that is a good thing and a bad thing. If you manually upgrade the, the version of, the, of Chrome, the thing is uh, Google can force you to, up, to update your application at some point if there is some uh, security issue or something like that. Maybe sometimes uh, it, this can happen and you have to update or your application can be removed from, from Google Play. So let's go to the second option, that is the Java APIs. The WebRTC already provides some bindings for, for Java, so uh, it's something that you already can, can use. Uh, the good thing with that is that you have access, all, all the video is rendered using native views, so you can integrate all the UI from uh, the, UI, the Android UI with your video views, so you can mix them and create your application as you want. And also, it's manu manually updated. And the, the problem here is that the, uh, the WebRTC is a big project. So there are pre-builds uh, available. Uh, Pristine.io was one of the most popular ones. 
but the, it's, a, it's a day outdated now. Uh, they are not maintaining anymore. So, and the other option is to compile it from the source. That it's not as easy, easy task. I think that other people is going to talk about that today. And for example, for Android, it doesn't compile on Mac or on Windows. So you need a dedicated box uh, using Ubuntu to compile it. So it's not uh, an easy thing to, to, to maintain. And the other thing, uh, the other, uh, this is our, uh, yeah, other things about the, the native uh, Java, the, the Java API. That the, the problem is that the, the, the API is more complex than JavaScript. Uh, mainly because it's Java and the language is different, but there are other things in, from Android that make that uh, a bit more complicated. Also, using that approximation, for example, the, the binary size is also bigger. It's like integrating the web view. For example, Pristine IO, uh, it, when you create something with Pristine IO, you have the 20 megabytes of APK size. Here in the, in, the Java, in the Java option, you have all other alternatives, like Topbox that, and other platform providers that uh, they provide the um, uh, Java API that you can use, and they just track all the peer connection API, so you don't have to care about that. Uh, and also, they do, do all the work of doing uh, all the signaling and everything there. And the last option, sorry, uh, is the C++ API. Uh, WebRTC is done in C++, so you can access all, uh, you, you can access all the to all the APIs in C++. That makes sense if your code base is already in C++. That is not a, maybe a common thing, but it, for portability, it's a, it's a good option. Uh, you still need Java access to, for, for the capturing rendering. In Java, most of the APIs are, or in Java and Android, sorry, uh, most of the APIs are uh, in Java. So you need GN, GNI to access to the camera, or there are new APIs, but it depends on the version. So at the end, it's complicated. But the good thing with that is you have the maximum port portability. The same code in C++ can run in iOS, Android, desktop, whatever, in uh, other platforms. And, but it's very complex to maintain. The, the C++ API uh, is not as stable al as the others. So they are changing the API. And sometimes, if you want to upgrade to the new version of WebRTC, you have to modify your code. So it's hard to maintain. Let's start with uh, this is the uh, using the, the Java API to create an application. This is the fun part, I think, at least for me. And the setup uh, we create a single uh, single activity application in using Android Studio. Uh, the thing is to start with doing some uh, using WebRTC. We need to decide something uh, about the signaling mechanism. You can use WebSocket, PubNav. This is up to you. You can use SMS if you want. Uh, this doesn't matter. But the thing is, for example, uh, I mean, the, in the example, I'm going to use Socket.io. That is very easy to set up a server with that. To get WebRTC, for the for the example, the easiest way is to to get a prebuild like Pristine IO. You add that to to your graded file, and you already have all the Java all the APIs needed to to use WebRTC. It's the only line that you have to add. The problem with that is not updated. The last version is from December last year, so that's a, an issue maybe. Uh, don't forget to add the permissions needed to access the camera, uh, to access to internet, and access to the microphone. And we can start with the WebRTC initialization. Uh, WebRTC is a, is a C++ uh, code. So at the end, this is the thing that the, I was commenting before, that uh, every, you need to access to all the APIs in Java. So there is this uh, initial method, the static method, that you, you pass the context to access to the, all the, the hardware APIs, something like that, and also to decide if you want to use audio and video and if you want to use hardware acceleration here. This is something that is needed for all the, to, from the C++ to access to the Java APIs. With this, you create the peer connection factory. That is the object that is used to create the peer connection. So next step is the video capture. Uh, the good thing is we're, we're, with WebRTC, they already provide all the setup to start capturing. So you don't have to know how to use the camera, the APIs, or something like that. So it's as easy as you, these two lines. You can get the, the name of the front-facing device, and you can create the video capturer using the name. It's, they already uh, provide implementations for, camera, for the camera API, so you don't have to, to deal with that. 
Also, in, they added some, uh, some weeks ago uh, the possibility to create a video capturer using uh, screen sharing. So you can screen share the, 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 the view from the application. So this is, there are some use cases, interesting use cases using that. That is it's a good thing. But it's not available in the Pristine I.O. Uh, compilation yet. I mean, they are not maintaining it. So here is the line to create the video capturer. And the next step is to add this video capture to something. In, in WebRTC, we have the concept of the media stream. That is, is what, uh, what we use to send the video to the other peer. So we need to add in the stream two, two tracks, the audio, audio track and the video, the video track. When we create the tracks, we set up the video source uh, using the video capture that we, we, have, been, we have created before. So after that, uh, we create the, the audio source and create the audio, tra audio track, and we have the local media stream. With this local media stream, we can start uh, showing the preview of the, of the local video in the local, in, in, in the application. For the rendering, here uh, in the, um, to, to see the preview of the local of the local video on the other peer, you, there are several options available in WebRTC. They are already provide these two. Uh, GL Surface View and Surface View Renderer. The difference between, between them is the GL Surface View is a common GL Surface View that is being used by all the renderers in the same, in the same conference. So you, you can overlap the video there, but you have to add the renderers in the order that you, the order that you want to, to, to put them in the, the screen. And all of them share the same uh, Surface View. It's, Maybe it's okay for some applications, but the, there is the other surface view renderer that you use a different view for every every video. So you can place the the views in the layout how in in, in any way. The problem with this last one is more is more flexible, but the surface view uh, views in Android have uh, layout issues. At the end, the implementation of surface views uh, surface view in in Android is done in they are, they are not really views. They are like windows over the, over the real window. So maybe you can have some lay layout issues. That's why and WebRTC provides the, all the APIs to create your own renderer. So at the end, if you, you have issues with one of them, uh, you can create your own renderer using texture view. Or maybe, for example, if you have a game, you can integrate the texture or the video frame inside your game. It's something that. It, it, you have the possibility to do it. So to, in the sample code, in this example, we are going to use the GL surface view. We get the surface view from the layout. And at the end, we create the renderers. This is the, the other peer renderer that we are creating first to cover all the, all the GL surface view. And we are creating uh, our preview renderer, covering only one part, uh, one square in, in the view. And if we add the, uh, the renderer to the local video track, we start seeing our preview. So with that, we have half, half, half of the way done, I think. We, the next thing is to create the peer connection. Here is, it's a bit, it's not tricky, but the, the thing is, you usually see the, the peer connection. When you create the peer connection, uh, people add some stand server from Google, but at the end, you need to provide your tarn and stand servers. It's something that you need for your deployment. Uh, if you don't have that, the peer connection, uh, maybe it works, it works in the local network, but it is, this is very probable uh, that it's not going to work outside your local network. Because at the end, sometimes there are firewalls or uh, NATs that, when, that makes you uh, to, uh, have issues connecting from one peer to the other. So this is very important. So this is where other third parties are important because, for example, Topbox that we provide all these things, so you don't have to 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 make your own, or to to deploy your own. So we create the, the peer connection using the peer, the peer connection factory that we have created before, and we add our local stream to the peer connection. That way, when the peer connection is uh, connected to the other peer, they will see our video. And here start the SDP negotiation. 
The SDP negotiation is the same that is on JavaScript. It's a, maybe it's a bit more ver verbose because uh, the way that you have to do it on Java, but you have to implement the peer connection observer and SDP observer to, to get notifications. They are the listeners to get the notifications from peer connection when something happens. We are sending on our sample code the SDP over Socket.io. That is our signaling uh, protocol. And this is the last step to have me, uh, media flowing. Uh, you have to remember also to, to add the, when you get the stream from the other peer, to add the render there to see the video from the other peer. This is the, the diagram of the, how the SDP negotiation works. It, it seems very complicated, uh, but it's not so much. At the end, uh, both clients connect to the server with, using Socket.io, and the server decides to send uh, the create offer that is uh, uh, the start message to one of them. So one of them, is, uh, using the peer connection API, creates the offer and sets the, the local description in this peer connection, of, uh, peer connection object. Then that generates, generates the offer SDP that you send to the other peer. The server is just relaying the, the messages, the message, and the client too, when it receives the, the message, sets the remote description and create the answer that travels to the other way, and they have the information of the codecs of both sides. So in this process, the, there are al also other things that are called candidates, that uh, when, whenever you start doing the SDP negotiation, uh, peer, peer connection automatically starts uh, trying, uh, or trying to guess what, uh, which IPs you have. So all the candidates are options to connect to your host. So if you have several time servers, maybe you would see more candidates here because you have more options to connect to you or something like that. And at the end of this process, we have the media established after this. And the server is something that maybe if you are doing Android development is something that maybe is uh, something that you are not used to, to do, but uh, the server is something as easy as that. This is a Socket.io server, only 30, 30 lines of code. It doesn't have any kind of logic. It only, when there is a message, an offer message, it, it sends the message to the other peers. Answer, the same, and the candidates, the same. So, and for the first one, it, it sends the create offer that to start the process. The server is very easy. At the end, also, the application is, it's also very easy, uh, it's very small. Uh, 260 lines of code for the Android application, that is the, the minimum thing needed to, to have video working. There is no error handling on other things, but it's something that is easy to understand. And the server is very small, as you, you have seen. Here you can find all the source code that uh, I uploaded here to GitHub, so feel free to, to use it and to test it. And some Android tips, Android tips for, uh, to finalize. Uh, things that uh, the binary size of the uh, application using WebRTC is very big. I recommend to use the split mechanism, uh, uh, creating different APKs for every architecture. At the end, the size is something important for the, for the final application, if you're creating something f f uh, a commercial application or something like that. Uh, Remember to stop the camera and the microphone. Uh, this is something that the WebRTC is not doing by, uh, for you. Uh, WebRTC doesn't have access to the events of the, con of the application. This is usually uh, handled by, by the activity. So you have to take care of st stopping the camera when you go to the background or stopping the microphone when you receive a phone call. This is, these are important things to remember. Audio root, routing, this is something that it seems easy when you connect the headset or a Bluetooth headset, something like that. It's not as easy if you look at the implementation of the AppRTC application, that is the, the example code that provided with uh, WebRTC. It's not as easy. There, there are a lot of edge cases, and it's better to, to look at an implementation and do something similar. And at the end, uh, if you want to to try new codecs like the v, VP9 or H264, by default, it's using VP8. But there is no way, easy way to select them, so you have to, at the end, uh, modify the SDP and reorder the codecs there to use one or the other. That's, um, it, it, maybe in the future is something is a bit easier, but now it's a bit complicated. And that's all for today. Thank you.
Thank you.